welcome back, scholars. I hope you all are, are doing extremely well. Um, going to cover uh, uh, sensation perception, chapter four. Um, really, really important uh, chapter talking about vision, um, hearing, auditory, or audition. Also talking about old fashioned gustatory system, um, the sense of touch. And so we'll talk about various systems, uh, how those systems work together to again, allow us to perceive uh, the world that we are in. And uh, vision is one of the most important, that's one of the biggest portions of the chapter. Um, but again, each has its own extreme importance. And a lot of uh, the senses that we have and what we perceive, uh, we often take for granted. And so, you know, I want you to just think about those who don't have uh, some of the senses that, uh, you know, again, we take those things for granted, you know, like sight and, and hearing. And, uh, for many of us who may have gotten uh, COVID and lost the sense of taste and the sense of smell. Um, you know, we, we take those things for granted until they're gone. And so we, we really need to appreciate uh, the processes that are going on inside of our body uh, almost automatically and uh, and just be mindful that uh, there are individuals around us who, uh, who don't have um, the sensation and experience the sensations and perceptions that we do. Um, so just be mindful of that as we move forward. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll move through um, the slide deck pretty quick uh, and uh, then we'll get out. Thank you so much for being here. Um, here are some of the objectives. Uh, and uh, again, as we move through, uh, I'll talk through some of the, uh, some of the most important parts uh, of, of sensation and perception. Okay. Uh, the first system that we'll talk about, one of the most important uh, is uh, the visual system. And we'll talk about some of the essential components of sight, vision, um, the structures of the eye, uh, the processes in which we uh, we perceive light and sound uh, will be uh, the second unit, uh, but the first unit will be uh, more so about a uh, visual system and how we, how we perceive sight and what we see, okay? Uh, so one of the biggest things that happens uh, when we see something is there is light being reflected or wavelengths of light being reflected off of surfaces or you know, if you're in a classroom and you're looking at the professor, light is being reflected off of the professor, um, off of their face and their body and, and, and they of themselves. And you are, that's what you're receiving. All right. You are, your eyes are seeing um, the reflection of that light. Okay. Light is what we call a electromagnetic radiation. And there is a spectrum of elect electromagnetic radiation that, um, uh, that is, exists in our world. You have a ultraviolet rays, you have X-rays, you have gamma rays, you have infrared, radar, uh, FM, television, um, and all of these are the electromagnetic uh, spectrum, right? Uh, humans are only able to see um, a specific piece of that electromagnetic spectrum, and the light uh, and the colors and the light that we see is in that, that small spectrum that ranges from around... Um, 380 to 400 nanometers to around 720 nanometers. And so the longer the wavelengths, uh, which we'll talk about, the longer the wavelengths you have, your reds, your oranges, uh, the shorter the wavelengths you have, your purples, your violets, your blues. And so we'll look at, as you see on the chart here, um, that's what you see. Uh, in the, with the longer wavelengths of light, um, you see uh, oranges and reds, and then you see the purples and the blues when you have shorter wavelengths. Uh, and so we have to be mindful of that. The light wave uh, has two distinctive um, functions and properties, uh, or physical properties, as, as we like to say, okay? Physical properties meaning you have your wavelength. Your wavelength is the length, the, the length between the two, two peaks, right? So the longer that wavelength, uh, again, you see a particular color. The shorter that wavelength, you see another, okay? Then you have amplitude, and amplitude of the height is uh, the brightness of what we're looking at, okay? So we have, we have a high amplitude of light wavelength, then we're going to see a brighter light, okay? Uh, purity uh, influences the perception of the saturation of color that we see or the richness of a particular color. If you're looking at the colors on the screen, this uh, spectrum here, it looks pretty pure. Um, and that is because uh, there is some whiteness that is not uh, in in the, mixed in with the colors. Any whiteness or any mixture of whiteness uh, is, 
it re reduces the amount of saturation of a particular color, right? So if there's less whiteness that's mixed in, um, in that mixture of color, then you'd have a more pure uh, and more saturated color. Okay. Uh, one of the, the acronyms that is used is Roy G. Biv, and this is the acronym that tells you kind of the spectrum. And it's kind of written in reverse. Roy, uh, you have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And so those are the, uh, the colors, and they, are, they, they, they range from the largest wavelengths all the way to the shortest wavelengths. And that's one of the easiest ways to remember um, the spectrum of color that we see uh, in wavelengths. And there's a mixture, which we'll learn about. Uh, any mixture of these colors produces other colors that we might not see uh, in this, this rainbow. Okay. Uh, again, here's just a diagram of the particular colors. So you have a darker red, which is really difficult to see here. Uh, has a little bit of longer wavelength, 700 nanometers. Uh, and then if you go all the way to uh, violet, which is really, really dark purple, then you see some of the shorter wavelengths at 400 nanometers. Uh, and again, we range from approximately 380 nanometers to around 720 nanometers. Uh, and again, the, the light uh, that we can see um, in electromagnetic radiation. Okay. Uh, so here is the instrument that provides us with the ability to see of the eye. Uh, light passes through the wavelengths or then pass through uh, the cornea, the pupil, and the lens, and it falls on the surface of the retina. And you can see that the cornea is the, uh, the clear part of the eye, and it focuses the light that passes through onto the back of the retina. Um, you have the retina and the pupil allows for uh, the light to pass through that, that black hole in the back of the eye. The iris is responsible, which is the color part, which is the iris. Uh, so I have, you know, brown irises. Um, they constrict and then dilate uh, when light is really, really high. You have a lot of light in a particular area. Your pupils will, will, will constrict. And when you go into a dimmer or a darker room, your pupils will dilate to allow more light uh, to come into the surface of the eye. Okay. Um, again, the images uh, that we see are actually upside down, they're viewed upside down. There's a reflection that we see uh, that we view the objects, objects upside down. However, when it hits the back of the retina and is then turned into a neural impulse, um, the, our brain, our occipital lobe, their visual cortex, then reorients the picture so that we see it vice versa. So what we're seeing in our visual world is, is actually uh, turned upside down. Again, our brains are, are doing a lot of integration and work uh, to turn everything right side, of course. Again, the pupil regulates the amount of light that passes into the chamber of the eye by constricting or dilating so that it allows more light in, less light in. Okay. Uh, the lens, as you saw in the previous diagram, is the structure that helps to focus additional light, uh, focus the additional light uh, energy to the back of the retina, to the back of the eye called the retina. Uh, about 80% of the light that's reflected, refracted, excuse me, from our stimulus from outside is kind of focused by cornea. And then the lens does an extra role in um, focusing it to the retina for us to either see close up or see further away. Um, our uh, lens is kind of naturally curved. Um, it's a naturally curved uh, structure. And when we wanna see something that's really, really close up, the lens will curve even more for us to see things that are closer and that will flatten out to see things further away. And there are two um, degenerative things that happen, right? So we have nearsightedness. Uh, I'm nearsighted, so you're able to focus light. Um, and again, the, the object falls kind of a short of the retina. So I, I need to be able to, uh, to have corrective lenses to focus the light so that it hits the retina at a, at a better angle, right? Um, so close objects seem uh, clear, but distance or dist or close objects are seen clearly, uh, but distant objects are appear blur. And the opposite for far sightedness that means you can see far, very very clear, far away. The objects that are closer uh, seem blur. Uh, and again, when you have those issues, corrective lenses help to correct to again focus the light uh, on, on the the right part of the retina. Okay. 
the pupil, as we talked about before, is the opening in the center of the eye, um, and the iris helps to regulate the amount of light that passes through that, that chamber. Okay. Um, how do we see, right? What's happening? Uh, the brain is really what's helping us to see and know what we're seeing uh, and help us to perceive uh, some of the, the stimulus that we see in our, in our world. The retina uh, is lined with neural tissue and that neural tissue then sends neural impulses through the optic nerve and through some of these other cells that you see, the bipolar layers, the bipolar cell layer, you have your ganglion uh, cell layer, and all of this is helping to, it's um, creating a neural impulse that is going through um, these structures and then it's sending it out to the optic nerve and the optic nerve um, is uh, has axons connected to it and it then connects to the back of our brain and we'll show you uh, in the next couple of slides how that works, okay? Uh, th this indention in the retina is called the fovea, and the fovea uh, is that spot in the center of the retina that contains uh, primarily only cones. Um, and we'll talk about what those are, but this is where the strongest visual acuity is at this particular spot. So when you are focusing your vision on a point, um, the, it's focusing or it's, the light is being reflected on the fovea at that particular point, and so you're seeing with the greatest acuity when you're focusing directly on a particular object, okay? Uh, there are two different photoreceptors or visual receptors um, in our eye, in each of our eyes. There are 120 rods and 6 million cones um, in each, each eye. And those 120 million rods, they are more sensitive to low levels of light. Um, and they, pull, they have poor acuity uh, and less info about color. So all of your cones are going to fit right here, near and around uh, the, the the phobia. And again, it needs more light. The cones need a great amount of light uh, for you to distinguish color in your in your, in your visual system. Um, and they provide you with greater acuity. Um, when you go into a dark room, it's really, really difficult to see a lot of detail. And so your rods, you're still able to see, um, but your cones uh, are less activated. Your rods are more activated. And when you're in a very, very well lit room, your rods are they're still working, but they're uh, less active uh, than your cones are. And so when you're making that transition from dark to light, your cones and your rods have to adjust. And we'll talk about that called a light and dark adaptation. But again, those rods and those cones are responsible for uh, light, being able to see in different uh, dimness or, you know, different low, low levels of light and different colors. Okay. If you look at the Mona Lisa, Leonardo da Vinci painted his pictures with different strokes of brushes, right? And here is an instance where if you focus your phobia on a particular area, you may see uh, Mona Lisa smiling or not smiling based on where you look um, because her lips were painted with a low detailed brush. Uh, and so what happens is if you focus your eyes on her eyes, right, you'll see her actually smiling. But then if you focus your, your eyes on her lips, it's less of a smile. Because when you focus on her eyes, the rods uh, are, they're, again, they're low detail. They don't provide a lot of detail. And it looks like she's actually smiling. But when you focus specifically on the lips, you see that even, again, it's low detail. So you can't really see the smile. You really can't really see. It's just a smirk. Right? But again, by focusing on her eyes, you actually see a, a smile. And you can pause that if you if you need to uh, to need to look at that. Um, again, as we talk about the brain, um, as we move from uh, a dark room to a light room, our eyes do adjust and adapt, and uh, it's what we call sensory adaptation. And uh, you know, the rods and the cones are responsible for you know being able to operate in well lit rooms or not. And so, dark and light adaptation is all about those rods and those cones and how uh, they have to readjust when going into a darker room, maybe you're going into a movie theater um, or coming out of a movie theater into uh, into the outside. You know, initially you get this burst of bright light and then your cones are then able to readjust to give you, uh, to let you see what you're seeing. It's, and the same thing goes with going and running, going into a dark room from a light room. You go in and originally your, your, your cones, I mean, your rods are not activated and then you see darkness and then after a while, then you're able to see um, 
you know, pretty, pretty well uh, in the darkly, dimly lit room. Okay. But again, when we talk about the processing of the retina um, and the receptive field that we see, uh, the retinal area is stimulated. It affects the firing of that cell, right? So particular areas of the, in that receptive and that visual field, uh, again, you have different areas in the retina that are stimulated, right? So the rods are stimulated when you're looking at something, um, you know, in a very dim lit room. And then the, con the cones are when you're in a well lit room. Okay. So what happens? Again, that neural impulse has to travel somewhere. And then how, and, and then what means does it travel? Right. So there are axons um, that leave the back of each eye and they form what we call the optic nerve. Uh, and they travel uh, to the optic chasm. The optic chasm is where those two uh, axons or optic nerves cross. Okay. The optic nerve, again, a bundle of fibers, and it carries those visual messages from retina uh, to the brain. And again, like we talked about, that optic chasm is here where the uh, right visual field left visual field, they cross over to, again, allow us to see what we're seeing. See, the left visual field is seen, right? You see the right visual field, you see things in the right, you can see things in the left, so by both eyes are seen uh, and are able to cross over and see each, each visual field, and so then they cross over to allow us to see um, and then integrate the information in our brain, okay? But again, both eyes go to both hemispheres of the brain so that Again, they integrate the information together. And all the information that we see uh, is, again, stored. And, and then uh, it's not, we have, a, uh, we have a database of information stored in our visual cortex. Uh, and there is a, in our memories, allow us to know that when I see a human being or when I see a familiar face, I know what I'm looking at because of the memory stored in my visual cortex. Uh, and then the visual cortex is also processing the information. Those neural impulses are then going to the brain and it's processing that information uh, so that the occipital lobe is allowing me to see uh, some of the, the most important details. Uh, there are different cells and neural neurons in our brain, uh, in our visual cortex that serve as what we call feature detectors. And these feature detectors, they are, they respond really selectively to different types of features. So you might have uh, neurons that respond to different strengths, uh, you know, angles, different shapes, different edges, the movement of visual stimulus, and different neurons are firing in different parts of the brain, depending on the different features that you're trying to detect, okay? And so as these signals move, the neurons become even more specialized about what turns them on. So if I'm looking at the edges of a table, then I'm seeing that, okay, there are the edges they're firing different neurons in my brain so that I see those edges of the table, okay? You have what we call a ventral stream and a dorsal stream in our visual cortex. The ventral stream allows us to know what objects are. And that ventral stream, again, there's a database. I know what a dog looks like, and I can distinguish what a dog is from a cat because of those different features um, that, I'm, that I'm familiar with and those specialized features. The dorsal stream allows me to know where an object is located. So, you know, I, I have a television off in the distance. I can see where it is based on uh, the information process in the dorsal stream. Okay. One other thing, really, really important pieces, right? We don't see the world in black and white. And so there are three primary colors that we use to, uh, to determine uh, different colors and mixtures of these colors are really important to give us variations of different colors. You have the red, greens, and blues. And you, again, you have the variations result in the mixing of these basic colors. Uh, when we have subtractive color mixing, um, you're removing wavelengths of light and you leave less light than was originally there. So on the right-hand side of the screen here, when you uh, subtract all wavelengths of light out, you get darkness or you get black, right? When you add all of the colors together, then you get white. So again, white is, again, superimposing light and putting more light into the mixture than exists in any one light itself. And when that happens, you get the white color here. So adding all the colors gives you certain colors and then subtracting uh, gives you uh, darkness or black, okay? But again, those are the two, two ways that we mix uh, the, the kind of the diversity of colors. 
there are two um, theories of, of vision, um, color vision particularly, that uh, work together in conjunction to kind of explain um, why and how we see color. Um, and they work together. Trichromatic theory is kind of the, the, the first stage of when we start to, to perceive color. And then the opponent process theory is kind of the latter stage of our color vision and the process of color vision. Um, the trichromatic theory uh, suggests that the human eye has three specialized colors, uh, and they differ in the sensitivities to different light wavelengths. So uh, you have red cones, you have medium or green cones, and you have short blue cones. And depending on the, sh the, the, the wavelengths, depends on which, uh, which cone is activated uh, and is used to uh, perceive what light we're looking at. Okay? Uh, a light of any color can be matched by, again, the additive mixture of these three uh, primary colors or wavelengths of light. Uh, and if the brain uh, receives primarily red and blue, then it's likely going to be more of a mixture of purple. So you see this red and blue wavelength here. If I mix uh, blue, uh, green, and, and blue together, and red, blue, and green together, I'm going to get some blues. Uh, if I get a, a great mixture of uh, yellow and green, I'm going to get a I'm gonna get a, a red and green. Then I'm going to get a lime green and blues. I have a higher, high, higher percentage or sensitivity to green here. So that's when you get this rich, rich green. And as you get more and more to the right, you get more concentrations of uh, red, blues, and blues. Okay? Uh, color blindness is uh, a deficiency um, in the uh, primary colors. Right? So one of the cones may not be working, maybe the red or the green cone. Uh, so maybe you're not even able to see uh, longer wavelengths of light uh, or uh, maybe medium medium excuse me wavelengths of light and so there's some deficiencies and uh, the most the most uh, common is that red and green uh, color blindness and um, a greater percentage of individuals who are colorblind are male um, again that red blue, red green color blindness um, but again when we talk about uh, color blindness most people will be called colorblind, what we call dichromatics, uh, instead of trichromatic. So they're able to use, uh, you know, two cones pretty efficiently, effectively, uh, but the other cone is, is not. Okay. So if you look at this next slide, um, those who are not colorblind will be able to identify uh, the, the, the numbers that are located in each of these images. So uh, if you go from the top left to right, you got uh, 7, 13, 16, 8, 12, and 9. And so for those who may be colorblind, um, they would be unable to distinguish between uh, and identify the numbers in, in, this, in these images. So again, the uh, red, green colorblindness or any other colorblindness with a deficiency in those cones kind of explains uh, the colorblind. Uh, uh, these next two examples are examples of uh, why the opponent process is a theory. And uh, there are three opponents for complementary colors, or yeah, complementary three uh, pairs of complementary colors uh, you have in your uh, visual system. Okay, so you have uh, yellow and blue, you got black and white, and you have green and red. And so, what I want you to do, I want you to stare um, at the laser pointer here. Okay, I want you to stare at that laser pointer. Um, for about, let's say, 10 seconds. And I'm going to flip the page, um, flip to the next slide, and we'll see if you can uh, see the image. So you want to stare. Five, four, three, two, one. And what you should have seen was a, an American flag, red, white, and blue, with, uh, again, uh, where you see yellow, uh, it was replaced by blue, where you saw black, it was replaced by white, and where you saw the green here, it was replaced by the red stripes. So, again, that's the trichromatic theory. Here's another one. I want you to stare at that gray dot there uh, at the middle for about 10 seconds. Five, so here we go. And five, four, three, two, one. And so, what you should have seen was a uh, Caucasian woman. Um, again, the grayscale shows you her in an image. This is a Caucasian woman. And then you, again, focus in on uh, the dot. 
you should see a flesh colored uh, woman. And, and oftentimes it after them, it just remains for a little bit. So you have to blink a few times to, to get it away. Okay. But those two examples explain um, the opponent process theory, um, again, which suggests that we perceive color and the perception of color depends on the receptors. Uh, and they make kind of an ag antagonistic response to three pairs of colors. And again, those complementary colors are green and red, yellow and blue, and black and white. Uh, and that after image that we saw, um, again, that is the image that kind of persists after the stimulus that we were looking at was removed. Uh, and so the trichromatic theory explains kind of the first part of the process, right? The, you know, processing with the cones, looking at and visualizing color through the cones. And then the later stages of the process seems to follow the principles of the opponent process. Because as I'm looking at those opposing colors uh, in the first part, and then the after image gives me uh, the other the other color, the opposing colors. And these complementary colors or pairs of colors, when you mix those two complementary colors together, you get gray tones when those two, those colors are mixed together. And so that is what we call the opponent process theory. Okay. Uh, here is an activity. Um, you know, the, the dress was a uh, kind of a phenomenon that, you know, people were really up in arms about on social media and in the media. And uh, part of the reason why the dress was perceived in different ways by different people was the picture oftentimes was presented in a different way. Um, here is what we consider the original dress, right? This is the gold and the white. And depending on the, the light, uh, the type of light, the angle of the light really depends on what color the dress you see. The, the opponent process and uh, trichromatic, specifically the opponent process theory, uh, kind of explains um, why you see the different versions of that. Okay, but when the, uh, the light is really, really cool and, and daylit illumination, you see uh, white and gold. And when the, the light was a little warmer uh, with an artificial illumination, um, you see it in a black and blue. Um, so with the proper amount of light, um, you see the actual color of the dress, which was white and gold. So your mind was playing tricks on you. Uh, it was actually the way that the, uh, the lights were, were presented on the dress itself. So how do we um, process um, perceptually what's happening in our world? Again, we talked about those feature protectors, those feature detectors, those neurons that are firing. And our brain is is doing a lot of work in the background. And, and when we look at something, um, you know, our, our, even when we're missing pieces of information in our visual system, our brain fills in some of the missing pieces at times so that we sometimes see things that aren't actually there. And uh, and we'll go through a few examples. Um, but when we, you know, we're perceiving the forms of things, the patterns and objects, it's really based on our previous experiences. And again, automatically, we, we begin to pick up on, um, again, different features and, and understand different figures based on what we've seen before. Um, the reversible figure is a, uh, and, and, you know, these types of uh, activities, they're done, not, I mean, they're cool, right? They're really, really cool, but, what happens is researchers wanted to understand how the brain and the visual system operate together. And, and if I can determine, you know, the assumptions that are made uh, by the brain naturally, then I may be able to better understand uh, how they work. Right. Um, so, again, reversible figure. Uh, this is a, a, a drawing that, you know, two different interpretations can shift back and forth. So if you're looking at this ambiguous figure on the right hand side here, uh, you know, some people may see a duck, and I've seen this image several times, so I know uh, many people are going to originally see the duck, right, for the bird. And then if you uh, turned your vision, maybe you turned your, 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 your head uh, and tilted it to the left, you may pick up and see uh, the, the bunny rabbit or the rabbit, okay? But it really depends on um, your interpretation. But again, there are two, two interpretations of this image. Uh, you just have to be able to see it. And once you see it, you'll flip back and forth and shift back and forth each time, okay? And uh, one of the keys to this image is your perceptual set. And this is just the readiness to perceive a stimulus in a particular way. So if you are more familiar with uh, birds, then you're probably gonna see a bird more often or quickly, more quickly, and that's the readiness for that particular figure than you would see the bunny rabbit. Um, one other uh, concept that's studied uh, is what we call inattentional blindness. And this is the failure 
uh, to see fully visual objects or events um, just based on our attention, right? If we're focusing specifically on uh, something off in, our, off in the distance, we're going to miss a lot of the other things that are happening around us because our focus is elsewhere. That's why it's important, like we were talking about with uh, task switching, um, if we're looking at the TV and trying to read and reading and trying to look at the TV, uh, we're missing we're missing valuable time, wasting valuable time, and uh, we're missing uh, missing information that we could uh, better grasp if we were looking directly and focusing in on something. Um, uh, one of the, the ways that we process information is by doing a, a complex process of feature analysis, right? Uh, so what we're doing when we're looking at an object is we're looking at the different features of the object. If I know what a chair looks like, then I know what it looks like when I'm looking at a chair or a dog. You know, I, I know the, the distinct features of what a dog looks like, um, and I'm able to see they have four legs and looking at, you know, their fur and, and their height and the size. Uh, and though there may be uh, different breeds of dogs, dogs have, you know, common, uh, common features. I'm able to look at those features to determine if it's a dog or a cat uh, based on those features. Uh, and what I do, what many people do, is they use both of these processes. Uh, they do bottom-up processing or top-down processing. And using a top-down approach, uh, I'm using and formulating my hypothesis uh, already, and then I recognize the stimulus, right? So uh, an example of this would be if I smelled cookies, right? If I smelled cookies baking in the oven, right? I smell cookies baking in the oven. And I smell them and I automatically know that there's cookies baking in the oven, right? Because I've smelled them before I, from, you know, past expectations. I know that, you know, that's happening, right? Those are the expectations I've already formed based on past experience. Or I smell barbecue, right? I smell, I smell barbecue. Somebody must be barbecuing the toast, right? Those are the expectations. I've, those are learned experiences. And I know that something someone is barbecuing. I, I can kind of go, go go find it, right? The bottom-up processing is when I'm, it's kind of data-driven, where I'm looking at individual components of something. So say I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at a cockpit, right, of an airplane, but the only parts of the airplane I can see are the uh, the handles that, that control the, the air, the, you know, the rudders, not the, I don't even know what, what are those, what, what other, what are you producing? You know, what are those, uh, the plane wings? Uh, you see different gauges, you see uh, different switches and, and lights. Uh, and I'm using all that information and that data to, to say, okay, you know, maybe that is a, uh, maybe that's a cockpit of a plane, right? Um, or maybe you're looking at uh, different images of a particular animal. You know, many of us know what a leg of an elephant looks like, the trunk, uh, the tail. And so I'm looking at them, uh, different images. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a, that's an elephant. Just based on all the data that I was given, I know that's an elephant. So top down, using my learned experiences, my previous experiences, expectations, to determine and recognize the stimulus. And with bottom up, I'm detecting the specific features of the stimulus to then recognize what it is. Okay. Uh, here are some examples of what we do when uh, these are some of the features that we. We're looking at the whole picture um, instead of just looking at the individual components. And this is what we call the just out principle. And this assumes that as humans, we look at the whole picture, uh, and the whole is greater than the sum of just the individual pieces of it, right? So we're not going to just look at you know each individual tick here. We're looking at the uh, the rapid succession of this stimulus moving around in the circle. Right. Even though we know, well, we, we may think it's uh, certain, it's honestly just a I mean, rapid succession. This is what we call the five. Um, here is an incident of just things being in, uh, you know, even close proximity and similarity. Right. All of these in this particular example, I see three columns of X, Y, X. I don't see four columns uh, or four rows of X. Right, so I just three. I see. I, I will see three columns before I see four rows, just because of the similarity in again all the axes, all the lines, and the second, row, the last row of axes. Right. Um, here is an, uh, another one. Right. You're looking at this is called a figure in rounds. Right. People organize visual perceptions in a fundamental way. You either looking at the background, 
Christ. Some people will say, I see two faces looking at one another. Or if I'm looking at the face, right? Which one are you looking at, right? Based on, so if I'm looking at the two faces and the white is the background and these are the figures, and I'm looking at the face, then the two faces are not the background and the face is the figure, right? So we have that, uh, we do that all the time when we're looking at different, uh, different figures. Uh, this is a, an example of closure, right? Uh, many people are going to say they see a triangle here, um, but in actuality, this is uh, just, I call these pac mans pac mans uh, arranged in a way um, where you start to see a triangle listed there. But again, um, that's our brain grouping elements together to create a sense of closure that, you know, we always try to complete things or complete and fill in the gaps of things that aren't there. Here are some other examples. You have similarity, like we talked about before, uh, simplicity and continuity. And all of these are some examples of kind of those principles that we talked about. And this is another uh, example of closure, right? Uh, these are just cones arranged in a way, right? But it, it looks like this is a sphere, right? And the cones are surrounding the sphere. Um, but again, these are just cones arranged in a way uh, on the screen. Um, one other thing that our, our visual system does is it perceives distance uh, and it perceives depth. And uh, depth perception is the way we use these visual cues uh, and it indicates how far away or how, how near uh, something and objects are to us. Uh, and the way we do this is through what we call our binocular vision. Right? We have two eyes and with those two eyes, it gives us kind of different cues from those two eyes and, and those differences help us to understand uh, the depth and, and the perception of depth uh, in our visual system, okay? Uh, and that what we call retinal disparity is that differing view in both of the eyes. Again, if you put your thumb, like here, this is your left thumb, you put your left thumb up, you close your right eye, and maybe you're putting it at, you're directly over, you know, your thumb directly facing your left eye, uh, and then you close your left eye, you see a totally different vantage point uh, from each eye, depending on where, uh, which eye, which thumb you used, right? Uh, the monocular depth cues, these are, again, uh, a distance based on the image from uh, either eye alone, right? But when you put them together, then you see a great, uh, a, a great difference um, in, um, in depth and how near and how far something is, okay? Um, there are assumptions that our brain makes and cues that our brain uses uh, to determine distance. Um, and there are some pictorial depth cues that artists use, even this artist, right? I know that this bush and this tree is closer and this building is further away because of the pictorial uh, cues about distance, right? This is very, very, this is smaller than these. And I can see some interposition here where, uh, you know, this seems to be overlapping this Right, so you know, I could determine that. I can determine that my thumb is closer, right, because it's larger than this building, right, and it's further away. And that's the assumption that I'm making based on those depth cues. Okay, here are just some some examples. You have linear perspective, uh, lines converge, and, and the viewer seems to, as those lines get closer and closer, things start to get further away. Um, and then you have a texture gradient. Things that are closer have more texture, more clarity, uh, more acuity, and those things that are far away, less distinct, um, and they're denser, right? So uh, interposition, like we talked about, things that are closer up overlap things that are further away, uh, similar to relative size. So I can determine that this outer blue is very, very close, and these are further away just based on the relative size of them um, and how they uh, appear in my visual system. Okay. And then here are some other uh, different examples. Okay. Um, some other misleading cues, um, you know, there's what we call perceptual constancy is one of the other concepts that we talk about. Um, and this is a stable perception um, in the face of everything that changes around us. Uh, I like to use the example of uh, I have a friend walking uh, down the hallway. Uh, my friend is a basketball player. He's six, eight. Right. He's further down the hallway and he looks like really, he's really, really small. Right. And, you know, someone in maybe the, uh, another another world was saying, oh, man, he's growing as he's walking towards me. 
but he's six eight he, down the hallway as he is uh, walking towards me. And one way that we can see that most of our hallways are going to be parallel. They're going to have equal distances between the floor and the ceiling. And so you can follow his head uh, on the same plane of maybe the cinder block. And you can determine that he's constantly the same size. He's just growing larger um, as it seems. But there's a, what we call a perceptual constancy. And it kind of gives us some order uh, surrounding the world. Um, and again, things grow, things get further away. Uh, if you turn the lights off, it um, doesn't mean that their people are gone. If you turn them back on, they're there again, right? Um, so that's the brightness and the color constancy uh, and then the shape constancy. Things are going to remain the same shape no matter where where you're looking at them. If I'm looking at a, a water bottle, um, you know, or looking at someone the side of someone's head, they're it doesn't, it's not changing shape. I'm just changing my vantage point um, and when, where I see it. And then the, uh, one of the other things that happens is what we call visual illusions. And, uh, you know, this happens when they turn the, the assumptions that we have on their head, right? Where we're looking at something, we think, we think we're looking at it and our brain is trying to integrate all the different information, but it's kind of a, what we call a discrepancy between what we see uh, in the appearance of a visual stimulus and what's actually uh, happening. Um, so we're using uh, the assumptions that we talked about, all those visual and pictorial cues, depth cues, and sometimes those cues are thrown off by um, some of the things that uh, people do with images in, uh, in the 2D. Okay. Um, so perceptual constancy, uh, these are some you know different examples. You got the Mueller liar vision, um, they'd ask you, you know, which of the uh, the two lines here are, um, are they the same size or are they different lengths, right, um, based on where they're located. And, and in this case, these two uh, are the same size, but many people say, oh, this one, uh, in the enclosed, these enclosed arrows are uh, creating this to be, to make the same, like the short length. Uh, the Ames room, this room looks like it's the same size, but the way that the room is constructed uh, it makes this person, this young, this young child, look like he's extremely smaller than this, this, this older, this, this child here. Uh, but again, it's just the room is arranged in a way because we have uh, an, an assumption that all rooms are perfect cubes, right? They're parallel, each each side, each room length and width is the same, and they're parallel and the heights, the ceilings are the same. Um, but this is again throwing throwing that off. Um, the Ponzo illusion. If you look at these further away, it looks like these lines are not parallel. These lines that travel uh, from up and to the right, um, and those hatch marks are making them look like they're not parallel, but in fact they are. Um, you remove those hatches and you would see uh, parallel lines. The moon illusion is the same. The interposition, it, it makes this, the moon look like it's extremely close, like you, you can throw a rock and hit it, uh, but it's the angle of the, the photographer and the camera, uh, and, uh, and it looks like that the moon is closer than it's supposed to be. So I'm going to stop right there and uh, we'll pick up, this is part one, I'll pick up on part two uh, for chapter four and, uh, and then we'll get, uh, we'll, we'll get on and move on to, uh, to chapter five. All right, take care and we'll, we'll see you on part two.